became a throne of grace as God himself our Savior drew near to take our place his mother smiled in wonder the shepherd stood in awe the sacrifice of heaven lay sleeping in the straw Take your Bibles and go back with me, if you would, tonight to the book of Titus, chapter number three. Uh, Brother Joe, I'm just going to try to stand here tonight. <clears throat> and um, Titus, chapter number three. I, I, man, I had really good liberty this morning. I appreciate the message that the Lord uh, placed on our hearts today. And I, <clears throat> I, I wanted to, I would wanted originally to get to where we're going to be tonight um, in my in my text this morning when I knew that there was there was no way I was going to be able to do that. But uh, <clears throat> man, the the verse number. Verse number four just just really has been resonating with me the last last few days. When you really think about the the kindness and the love that God's shown to us, when you really when you really stop and you really consider, you know we're we're busy and oftentimes I'm afraid we don't do enough considering. Oftentimes we don't do enough remembering, we don't do enough reflecting, and you're going to find even those that type of wording in our text tonight. Now. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to give you some thoughts tonight, some very simple things um, by way of by way of going down through these texts. Because what we looked at this morning, we really looked at the the middle portion. Uh, so um, this is going to be this is going to be kind of corny. Uh, but if you make if you make a cheeseburger, you've got a bun on the bottom, you got a bun on the top, you got the meat in the middle. Well, this morning we we looked at the meat that was in the middle. Uh, in other words, nothing would be what it is without that meat in the middle. Nothing would be nothing would be significant had it not would it not be for what's sandwiched between uh, what we're going to deal with tonight, and so we're going to look at the prior and the and the ending of this uh, with the mindset of we are we have been recipients or made to be recipients of that salvation. I told uh, if you wasn't here this morning, I told uh, the folk that was here this morning that 
I was going to be preaching, Lord willing, through the month of December on Tis the Season of the Savior. Uh, and that many times, and I, I, I gave the references, I think 37 times in Scripture, the name or the title Savior is used. And so we're going to be looking at some of those throughout the month of December, particularly on Sunday mornings. Um, but I felt like that this was significant, that we need to look at the remainder of this passage. Uh, because sometimes, sometimes I'm afraid that we can get the mindset, okay, I'm saved, and that's all I need. I'm saying you realize tonight that salvation is just the beginning of that which we need. Salvation is not the end of it. Salvation, rather, is the beginning of it. And so would you stand with me in honor of the reading of Scripture tonight? <clears throat> Thank you for being so kind and, and patient with us as we're trying to uh, navigate the waters of, of all we're trying to do here. And uh, When I called Brother Mike and asked him, I, uh, he says, everything okay? I said, yeah, I feel like I got an elephant sitting on my chest. And he said, well, I got about 10 years on you. It's not going to get any better, so I appreciate his encouragement. <laughs> and so uh, we're dealing with that, and, and, uh, and so I appreciate you being gracious to us tonight. And, uh, and thank you so very much for being back in the service tonight. Look down in verse number 1 of Titus chapter number 3. He says, put them in mind. Now notice that, put them in mind. That's what we were just talking about. He said, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And this is where we started this morning, but we're going to read this again tonight. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Let's do this tonight. One more time. Let's just go to the Lord more to prayer and ask the Lord to help us tonight in the service. Brother Jason, how about take us on prayer if you would? Amen. Thank you for standing tonight. You can be seated. <clears throat> we did talk about this morning about when we dealt with verses 4 um, and uh, verse number 3, verse number 4, and verse number 5. We talked about the intervention of the Savior. And I, for one, am still grateful that God intervened in my life. I'm thankful that he did not allow me to carry on in the path in which I was going uh, unchecked or unwarned or without, without giving me the knowledge that I needed. I'm thankful that he intervened. In my life, and I tried so very, so very hard this morning. I wanted the people that was here this, today to know uh, that God is still intervening in the lives of people. Uh, there are people all over this world today who need a divine intervention, and God's still willing to do that. The greatest message we'll ever share is not a message about how to make people more, uh, more independent Baptists, not how to make people more religious, how to make people uh, more convert. No, no. The greatest message that we'll ever teach people is the message that Jesus is still intervening in lives. Now, uh, I believe the Independent Baptist comes. I believe all that's significant and important. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but I'm telling you the greatest message that we can focus on sharing is not a social gospel. It is not a mes message of, of, of just simply helping someone socially, helping someone financially, even helping someone medically. The greatest thing that mankind needs is a divine intervention of a holy God. And I'm glad tonight to know that God is still intervening in the lives of people. God is still taking the drunkard and intervening in his life. God is still taking the drug addict and intervening in his life. God is still taking and those that have busted up their homes through infidelity, through sin, through perversion, through wickedness, and God can still intervene in those things. He can still put that home back together, and God can still do what man cannot do. God can still take the one who's walked away from God. God can still take the one who has no desire for the things of God, and God can intervene by His grace in their life and can change them uh, for the cause of Christ, and they can walk from that point forward and be different. Remember those words, but after that You say, well, preacher, why would God do that? God does not do that because he seeks to, to send judgment, but he does that because he seeks to show kindness and that he seeks to show love. Man, God is kind and God is loving. Our world needs to know that Jesus is kind 
And Jesus is loving. Yes, God is a God of righteousness. God is a God of judgment. God is not a God that's going to play and, and toy around with sin, nor is He going to excuse it. But I want you to know something this morning. The God that we serve, the God of the Scripture, is a kind God. He is a loving God. He is a long-suffering God. And the greatest news we'll ever share is the fact that we have a Savior that's willing to intervene in the lives of the people in which we live. And so uh, we looked at that this morning. And so tonight, I want us to look a little bit uh, further along that line because now we're told, uh, what do we do if, if God has now intervened in my life? I have received Christ as my Savior. What now? Because again, it's not the all in all. That, that is not the end all of it. That is the beginning of it. You know, Christianity in and of itself uh, is not just an event, but rather it's a walk. My salvation was an event, a one-time event. Now... I am continually and progressively being sanctified as I grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, That is a process. Uh, we, we, we didn't really cover that, but that's mentioned when it talks about uh, the renewing of the Holy Ghost down in that, in that verse. Verse number, what is it, six? Verse number five. Uh, there's a process in that, but my salvation is an event. But my Christian life, my Christianity, uh, that is a daily a weekly, monthly, yearly, that is a walk, not just an event. And so how do we live, or what is, what, is, what is Paul writing and telling this pastor, hey, tell this to your people. As you, uh, Titus, as you stand up now, uh, Titus was left in Crete. These were, these were Gentile, uh, predominantly Gentile believers. No doubt there was Jewish influence there, but as he was left there in Crete, I don't know what their church services looked like. You know, I don't know if they sung a hymn. I don't know if they sung, if the choir sung. They took up an offering and they shook hands and, and took prayer. I don't know how they did it, but he said, when you get up before your people, make sure you address this to your people. That tells me it was important. It was important. Now, notice what he says. He says, put them in mind. Again, I'm stressing that word, them. Who are, who are them? Who are they that he's speaking of? He's speaking about those who have been recipients of God's divine intervention. I don't know your case tonight. I don't know your story. I know it's the Sunday night crowd. I don't know where I don't know where you land spiritually, but I want you to know this. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you're part of them. You, if, you're, if you've ever experienced salvation, you're one of the ones that God has intervened in your life. But he said, put them in mind. Put them in mind. It means to cause them to remember. Now, it's unique. I think it's kind of unique when you look at this, and, and uh, there's, there's a lot that, that can be said about this, and we're not really going to go into the... Uh, to the history of it as far as the, the secular history surrounding this. But he says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. He's dealing literally with the duties of a citizen. Do, should, should an intervention of Christ, can I ask you this, should an intervention of Christ make a difference in what kind of citizen you are? Oh, absolutely. It's going to affect every facet and area, every area of your life. Now, he's not calling for them to enter into politics. He's not saying, listen, and by the way, we need, we need Christian politicians. I'm not preaching against that, but I'm, I, listen, he's not saying, listen, Titus, you need to go into politics. And what you need to do is you need to preach on Sundays and you need to be in politics on, on Monday. He's, that's not what he said. He said, but put them in mind to be subject to, uh, to, to, bring, to willfully bring yourself under this authority to the principalities and the powers to obey willingly, if you would, the magistrate to be ready to every good work. What's he doing? He is dealing with those who have been born again, those who have been had an intervention of Christ. He is dealing with them as to how to behave themselves in society in which we live. Could I ask you this? Can anyone see your Christianity? Can anybody see it? Now, I'm not, here, I'm not here preaching at you. I'm literally here preaching with you. All right, because I believe that it's a struggle that we need to be mindful that somebody ought to see our Christianity. Somebody ought to see that as I go to the workplace. Somebody ought to see that as I'm driving in traffic. But I'm, I'm telling the truth. Somebody ought, can anybody see their Christianity. Somebody ought to see our Christianity in what we post on social media. You said, preacher, this has nothing to do with, 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 with what Titus chapter 3 is saying. Well, I wonder if he was given this in modern day, how much of that it would, it would entail. 
Wonder how much it would entail. Why? There's a lot of people that lose their testimonies because they can't keep their mouth shut on the social media platform. Now, I'm not trying to be hateful. I'm not trying to be ugly. Listen, you don't have to like every politician. You don't have to like, I don't like them all. Matter of fact, the older I get, the least of them that I even like, period. I don't care what letters after their name. All right, but he says, put, put them in mind to be subject to bring yourself under the powers that be. In other words, as a believer, we ought to be good citizens. Uh, you know, people are so, they're so distraught over Christianity in our society. But you know, the real, the real scenario, if they would really look at it, God's people should be the best citizens. They should be the best husbands. They should be the best neighbors. They should be the best fathers, the, the best mothers, the best husbands, the best wives, the best grandparents, the best friends. Why? Because it affects every facet of our life. Best citizens in this country ought to be born again children of God whom God has intervened in their life. And so he said, put them in mind. Remind them of this. I believe that they had the same problem sometimes we do. They get so caught up into the frustrations and the fears and everything of the day in which we're living in. He said, those of you that's experienced that divine intervention, be mindful of this. Then he says this, to put them in mind to be subject, but also to speak evil of no man. Now, when you get to verse number two, man, verse number two is, is pointed. Verse number two is pointed. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. The phrase speak evil means to, to, to speak re reproachfully at, to rail at, or to revile. To revile. He says to be, no, to be no brawlers. Now that doesn't necessarily mean to roll up your sleeve and pop somebody in the mouth. All right, I, I would say that's not a good idea either. Okay, but, but the spirit of being a brawler is not just the physical aspect of it, but it's also the verbal aspect of it. You know, you'll find out that heavily that he deals a lot with our mouth and what comes out of it when he's dealing with God's people. He really does. All right, uh, with that of anger and that with animosity and that of bitterness, and he deals a lot of that. So he said, be, be no brawlers. It literally means don't be contentious. Webster's defines it this way, apt to contend or given to angry debate, quarrelsome or perverse. There's some people that just love to argue. They, I mean, they just love to argue. They, they love it. They love to start something. They're always looking to start something. They're always looking to ruffle somebody's feathers. They're always looking. But here's the problem with that. Uh, listen, those things aren't becoming Christ. They're not profitable. He said, I want you to put them in mind. Be mindful not to be uh, this way. He said, in fact, on the other end of that, be gentle. You say, well, preacher, I, gentleness, I'm, I'm a man's man. I'm not gentle. Well, you might want to be careful of, of who you throw out of that category. And I'll, I'll share that here in just a minute. Gentle means this, equitable, fair, moderate, forbearing, not insisting on the letter of the law. Now, I want you to process that for just a minute. You know, we're, we're, we deal with people, don't we? Most people aren't perfect. Most people are not going to get everything just right. Most people. Some of you got it figured out, and God bless you. But the rest of us, we're still working on it. Now, what he's talking about is, 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 is you know, we don't have to be so letter of the law on every little thing that they have to do everything just like we do. They have, they have, to, they have to practice everything just like we do. We don't, I don't have to be contentious of that. Listen, I, I, I've said this, and I want to be, I want to be cautious, and I don't, I don't want to be in the flesh. I, don't, I, don't want to, I want to be mindful of what God is talking about. But let me tell you something that it impacts our movement. It's easy to preach against the other movements. It's easy for me. It's easy to preach against the, the, the doctrine that I disagree with in the Methodist church and, and the Presbyterian church and the Pentecostal church, the Catholic church. It's easy for me to preach all of that. But let's talk about home for just a minute. We are so bad to, to literally turn on our own people. To turn, to bite, and devour our own people. And most of the time, it's not about anything significant. We're just nitpicking. We're just nitpicking. We are, we are acting, we are, we are, we are pre presenting ourselves as if we're perfect and we got it all figured out and they should come up to our level. All right, now let's read the verse again. He said, to speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And so that word gentleness means, listen, don't hold everything to the letter of the law if it's not significant. It expresses that the considerateness that looks humanely and reasonably at the facts of the case. 
humanely. You know, some things we just ought to look at with a, with a reasonable thought process. At the fact that yeah, it's rendered gentle. It's, it's in contrast to contentiousness. And so in other words, it's the opposite of contention. It's the opposite of that word brawl. Don't be a brawler, but instead be somebody who's not that way. Don't be so contentious. Don't be so quick to stir, up, stir the pot and be in the middle of everything. Uh, and, and then he, and he goes into the reason why. Now the consideration is found in verse number verse number three. By the way, the phrase that that meekness uh, it has to do with being willing to take the wrong, even when you're maybe not in the wrong. That's that's where that's where it refers to. You know, Jesus was meek to be willing to take the wrong, to be willing to take it and say, you know what? At the end of the day, whatever, you know. All right, but here's here's the consideration. Here's the consideration. The consideration is found in verse 3, our text verse from this morning. Be, to speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, but gentle. In other words, get, here's the picture. We're, we're picking this one out, and he's wicked, and he's wicked, and he's ungodly. And I'm going to set him straight, and I'm arguing with this whole crowd, and I'm going to prove my point to here, and to here, and to here, and they need this, and they need this, and they need this. And, and Paul says this. He said, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. So the perspective of verse number three goes back to say, hey, listen, our, our need was revealed that yes, we need a savior, but as we deal with people, that's a fun thing to do. But as we deal with people, may we be continually considerate that we were once and sometimes still are just like they are. We're not perfect. We're not, we, we are forgiven if you're saved by the grace of God. All right, and so he said consideration of these things. How do we accomplish this? I believe we can do this simply by following the model of Christ. You realize in verse number one and verse number two, Jesus Christ himself models both of these things. Both of these things. What's he say? Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Did Jesus do that? Absolutely. Hey, Jesus, they want to know, that he wants to know don't we pay taxes? He said, yeah, I want you to go catch a fish. There's going to be enough to pay the tax. Man, I, I, listen, I, I'm going to be fishing here in about April. He said, yeah, go, go catch a fish. And, he, and the coin was in the fish's mouth. Y'all remember? Render under seizure that which is seizures. What does Jesus do? He sets the pattern that, hey, listen, we're living in this world. Uh, we're not of this world. We're living for another world. But until then, we're, we're to be the right kind of citizens with the right kind of testimony. Now, this is, this is a, a, a side note for just a minute. Personally, as a pastor, man, COVID was difficult for everybody. COVID was difficult because I think, I feel like that, I feel like that in our church we had, we had a, a, or in churches in general, I think that there was a dual dynamic. Number one, I do feel like that there was an, it was an infringement upon our right to assemble. Don't get mad at me. I, I believe that it was an infringement of our right to assemble. I, I have the right, if I want to risk it, I have the right as an American citizen to assemble together with people, to worship freely. I have that right as an American citizen. Okay? However, I also have a responsibility to heed my government. And COVID forced us to try to make those two married, and man, it was tough. It, it was difficult because you, you run into go, what you feel like government overreach and you run all these things. But when we closed down, we closed down for the sake of testimony. Brother Brent, I, he and April, I know that they've moved, but Brother Brent can tell you some of the conversations that he and I had over, okay, how do we do this from this point forward? What are we trying to accomplish? Well, uh, people are still going to Walmart, but I can't help that. But what I do know is when people drive by and our cars in the parking lot, it makes us look like we don't care. And so we went through this whole thing. What were we trying to do? We were just simply trying to be the right testimony to a lost world. Did I agree with all of it? You can see me after service and I'll let you know. Uh, did, did, did people differ in those things? Absolutely. Did we find, have some biting and devouring in this country over that? Absolutely. All right, but we should have displayed Christ. But Christ heeded. I got off track. But Christ heeded that of 
government, all right? Then he also says this, to speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Did Jesus do that? Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb before the slaughter, so opened his not his mouth. You said, what was he doing? When they reviled him, he just behaved himself wisely. And so I think we can follow the pattern of Jesus. Submission to government, meek, mild, and gentle. Uh, he had the right disposition, which is a matter of the heart. All right, so let me let, let, now let's go to the other side. Now let's go to the to the other to the to the bottom side of the bun, if you would. That was a horrible analogy. What are you preaching on? Preaching preaching on a cheeseburger on Sunday night. That's all I got. <clears throat> now, for those of us who have had the divine intervention of God, what else does He say? He reminds us that being justified by His grace, in verse number 7, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now you can stop right there and say this. We as God's people ought to live like we are somebody. We ought to live like we are somebody. You say, why is that? Because of the intervention of Christ, we are in fact somebody. Uh, we are heirs of eternal life. We are, we, are, we are living for another city, for another world. And we are, we are banking on the hope and the, and the trust in, in, in what Christ is going to accomplish in us and through us. All right, and then he says this in verse number 8. He said, this is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. So let's talk a little bit about this truthful word. Faithful saying, truthful word. Here's what he says. It's a word that which he had already told them. What word was that? Verses 4 down through verse number 7. How to be saved, why they need to be saved, and so how, how they can accomplish those things. And so he gave them those words. He said, now hang on to those things. Hang on to that word. Affirm it constantly. Now the significance of affirm constantly. She's going to make it. She's going to live. <clears throat> the significance of to affirm constantly is, is really not that difficult. He said, okay, Titus, I want you to get up and I want, you to, I want you to tell your people. It does not mean that every message he is reminding them over and over and over and over. It's a word that literally means to confirm this consistently. Consistently. Uh, you know, we live in a day to where there's, there's not a lot of consistency in anything. He said, I want you to confirm this message consistently. Now, if you go to the other epistles, you go to the other letters that he wrote, uh, you find out that there was a lot of things that crept in that changed the thinking, for, uh, for, for instance, in Galatia. All right, what happened? They crept in and the, the doctrine changed, the message changed. He said, I want you to confirm this consistently. I want you to confirm it consistently, uh, uniformly, consistently. Now, and the audience of this is, is tells us who it is. Who's he talking to? That they which have believed in God, their Savior, those which have put their faith and trust in Christ. All right, so then what does he tell us to do? He said that they might maintain good works. They might maintain good works. Now, I want you to run. We're going to stay right here in Titus, but I want, I want you to, to think about this thing of good works. Now, that phrase was used in verse number one of chapter number three. Uh, to be ready to every good works. Can I, can I ask it this way? Are good works important? For a believer, do good works matter? I mean, we're saved. After we're saved, we're going to heaven. Does it matter how I live? Absolutely. Uh, does it matter not only how I live, but the type of work that I'm in, in, involved in? Absolutely. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, if you go into some of this in chapter number three, it deals uh, in some of the wording and some of the, some of the things. It's, it deals with not only how you do what you do, but what you do. Now, for instance... Um, we would not say that it would be a good testimony to make illegal gain, right? Uh, if I'm making, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm earning my living, if I'm earning my wages uh, from something that is openly against the law, that's probably not going to be conducive to me being a good representative of Jesus Christ, right? So if y'all are getting your money illegally, you deal with it. Don't tell me about it. But it deals with that. But, but good works, particularly as we would look at these, would be our service and how we serve the Lord. All right, so let, let's, let's go back to chapter 2 and verse number 7. <clears throat> he says, In all things, though showing thyself a what? A pattern of good works. A pattern is simply an example. Now, if you go back to chapter number 2, you also you'll find as well how that the older men were to teach the younger men and the older women will teach the younger women. Now, let me take a time out and say this th this evening. Uh, we are living in a day to where we need some older men who are willing to step up to the plate and teach some younger men. 
We, we need some older men. I'm not being ugly and I'm not being, I'm, we, listen, we got to stop checking out on this thing. We got to stop checking out. We got to stop walking away. I'm telling you, it is a biblical pattern for discipleship, for mentorship, to lead people and to direct people and to guide people. It is not my pattern, it's God's pattern. You realize that there are younger men who are starving for the influence. They're starving uh, for someone to look to. They are longing for that. And if we don't give them the right person to stand, I can promise you this, somebody will step up and fill that role. And don't get mad whenever somebody fills that role. They follow him and say, well, they ought to know better. No, we ought to teach them and exemplify what it means to live in a, in a pattern of good works. Same with the ladies. Man, the older ought to teach the younger. I'm afraid we're living in a day that it's starting to do this. I, listen, I, I said before, I don't, I don't want to get in the flesh, but I'm telling you, this ought to be a challenge to, to those of us, in, particularly my, I feel like I'm older. I don't have any hair. My wife said, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any hair. What I've got is, is what I've got is gray. My beard's gray. I'm almost 50. I mean, I, really. I, I, in my mind, I ought to be 28, but I got kids older than that. I'm just telling you. And I can't afford, and the generations that's coming behind us cannot afford for our generation to step to the side and say, you know what, let them figure it out. We did. Man, I'm telling you, listen, he said to, to live in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. All right, now let's drop down to verse number 11. This gives us some perspective. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live. How, preacher? Soberly, righteously, godly. You just can't do it, that preacher. Too, the world's too wicked in this present world. Yes, you can. We are called unto good works. Well, preacher, how do you know we are called unto good works? Glad you asked. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us, speaking of Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Man, we like that part. Man, I want to be saved from my sin. I want to be delivered from my sinfulness. I don't want to face the wrath. Man, he redeemed us. That's wonderful. We like that part. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of mediocre lifestyle. Zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. <clears throat> Have you ever watched the, uh, now when they get older and they get spoiled and <clears throat> they're starting to pay college players, I, that, that frustrates me, but that's, that's a whole different, that's a whole different scenario. Uh, now, they're, now they're laying out missing school and all. Anyway, that's, you know, they're just nothing but spoiled professional athletes. But anyway, you ever watched a, a little child make a ball team? Yeah, I mean, you ever watch them go to tryouts? The bat's bigger than they are. I mean, they're, they're dragging that bat in the sand. You can't find britches that fit, so they're longer and they poof up around the cleats at the bottom. Or if you come from somebody, they get the hand-me-downs from their older siblings, and you put two pair of socks on them. That way you don't have to go buy a new set of cleats. Some of y'all can't even enter in. Some of you is laughing. You either grew up that way or you've made your kids do that. But, man, they make that team. Now, now I'm, a, I'm a product of the 70s, a child of the 80s. Say amen, Brother Chuck. Good decade. All right. When we played, when we played Little League, when we played Little League, we, we did, even in West Virginia, we had uniforms. We really did. And cleats. We did. And real gloves. It, we, we did. Uh, but I remember, I remember getting that uniform. I, I played for the A's. And I wanted to play for the Reds so bad. Man, I wanted to play for the Reds, but all the preppy kids played for the Reds, and so I got stuck on the A's, which we ended up beating them for several years. Glory days. But I remember getting that uniform. And, Taylor, I remember what it was like to say, man, that, that's my team. And I'd put that hat on, and, you know, it probably come down over my ears, and, and uh, I'd, I would, I'd go out, and I'd wear that. And, it, you know, we were the A's. We were bright yellow and green. We stood, to say we stood out was an understatement. But, man, we wore that uniform, Brother Chuck, like we were somebody. You'd have thought we just finished the Marine Corps. I mean, we were somebody. And, and we, were, we, were, we were zealous. We wanted, we wanted to get there. Uh, when they're in Little League, by the way, in Little League, they still like practice. In high school, they hate it. In Little League, practice is awesome. It's fun. I get to throw the ball. I get a hit. I get to run. I get to do all these things. I just want to run, Coach. Tell me where to run to. Run to the pole and back. Okay, Coach, I'm getting I'm on. Well, they're zealous. Just tell me something to do. When they get in high school, man, I hate running. 
I hate running. I don't want to. Get, I don't want to go to the weight room. I don't want to work out. I, you know, there's stuff on. I'm in good enough shape. I'm okay. We'll make it. Even one day is not going to kill me. What happens? Somewhere along the line, age and zeal take over. I wonder if the same thing happens in our Christianity. When we first, when we first have that intervention, man, we're zealous of good works. I want, I want to tell somebody. I want to show somebody. I mean, he changed my life. I'm going to live different. I'm going to implement this in my life, and I'm going to implement this in my life, and I'm going to implement this in my life. But then before long, something happens, and we find that we've got to be reminded to be careful to maintain good works, to be careful to maintain. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to give you some of these because I want to finish. The careful to maintain just simply means to be mindful of. Again, it's dealing with your mind. Be mindful of con- continually maintaining or continually serving in the Lord. Listen, God called us to serve Him. God intervened in our lives that we might make an impact and a difference in the world in which we live in. He says, these things are good and profitable unto me. He said, preacher, I really, really, really want to make a difference in my community. I want to make a difference in my family. I want to make a difference in the society and I live. Where do I start? How do I do it? Let me tell you how you do it. You start by living faithfully and showing yourself a pattern of good works. That's how it starts. And people see that. People notice that. I can prove it. I can prove it. You go to somebody's funeral and you listen to the words that's spoken over them. Listen. Listen to what people say. And they'll walk by or they'll talk in the foyer. Most of the time, the real talk is in the foyer. If you want to be honest, if you go to a funeral, most of the time, if you really want to know the testimony of that person, listen to the words in the foyer more so than the flowery words in the front. Because in the foyer is where all the buddies are gathering. In the foyer is where all the groups are gathering that they met. And you'll hear somebody say like, man, he was a good guy. Man, he always did this or he always did that. You say, why is that? Because his actions, his works spoke for who he is. You say, well, that's small and insignificant. No, it, it's, it's huge. It's huge. And so it ought to impact our life that we might be careful to maintain good works. But then he tells us this. He tells us to invo- avoid some things. And he gives us a warning, an admonition. I got, I got four things I want to give you, and I'll let you go to the house. You say, well, preacher, if we're, to, if we're to, to do all of these things, and he says, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies. Avoid means to turn your back on. That sounds rude, doesn't it? You ever turn your back on somebody when they're talking? That is rude, by the way. I wouldn't recommend that. But the idea of that is stay away from that. Just get yourself out of this conversation. Now, we were talking about the contentiousness of people, how they're always, some, there's, there's people that's looking to, to, to fight. There's people that are looking to argue about everything. He said to avoid that. Foolish questions in genealogy, it literally means stupid questions that aid in conflict. You know, the Bible is a plain book. Well, preacher, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no dumb question. Yeah, there really is. There, there, and he says to avoid the stupid questions that aid in conflict. If I'm just doing something, I'm listen, I'm not talking about if you've got a question that you, that you genuinely want to know, man, ask it. Go to somebody and ask it. Seek counsel from someone that you trust, from someone that can mentor you and help you. To that, I would say, yes, there's no foolish question. I'm talking about this crowd that prides themselves in, in being contentious. I'm going to stir the pot. Let me give you, let me throw something in at it, and I'm going, to, I'm going to mix everything up doctrinally, socially, and all that. You know what he says? He said, you better turn your back on that stuff. Can I tell you this tonight? We don't have time for that kind of nonsense. Child of God, we don't have time. To, you don't have time to engage in every Facebook war. You don't, have time to, you don't have time to do that. You're going to be miserable. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be defeated. You're going to be angry. You're going to be hateful. You're going to be spiteful. And you're going to grow bitter over something that matters absolutely nothing. You're not going to change them. They're not going to change you. You're not going to change them on their, on their religion. You're not going to change them on their politics. I'm just telling you. And so, and so to have a conversation with someone, man, ask the question. You know, there are, there are people that I can find in that I may feel like, man, this is a stupid question. But my heart of the matter is not that I'm trying to stir up trouble. I'm, I'm trying to get an answer. We're trying to talk things out. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about the foolishness of questions that gender strife. And that's why he said avoid it. Stay away from it. Child of God, you don't have time to do that. Don't waste your life engaging in all that kind of activity. Live for Christ. Let them see the difference. He says contentious. It's a word that means wranglings. It's the act of disputing 
but, but doing it angrily. You, you know, we know what angry disputing looks like. Take two siblings. I had it first. There it is, right there. I had it first. We don't care about you. We don't, we don't care about who you are, how old you are. It doesn't matter whose toy box it came out of. You just need to know I had it first. The next phrase is, that's mine. If you only have one child, you can't enter into, in, enter into the, to the reality of what I'm talking about. That's mine. Yeah, that's mine. I had it first. That's mine. I had it first. And all of a sudden, the, the more they talk, the angrier they begin to get. Now, I'm telling you something. Listen, child of God, we don't have time for that. We don't, we don't have time for that. We, we have been saved. We have been intervened upon through the Savior. We don't have time for that. And he says, go back to verse number three. We ourselves were sometimes foolish. He said, we don't have time for that. He said, then we don't have time to, to deal with, turn your back on the strivings about the, the law. Persons at variance, strife, contention. Again, quarreling. He said, all these things are unprofitable and vain. You are wasting your breath, you're wasting your time, and you're wasting your influence. You're wasting it. He said, don't, don't, don't give yourself to that. Now, does that mean that we overlook everything? Not at all, and I'm done. Well, preacher, if I'm not supposed to be, I, you mean I'm not supposed to take a stand? Oh, that's not what he says. Because he says this, he said, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he is subverted. You, you know that, that word literally means he's twisted inside out. The word subverted. You know, he, he's just, he's all messed up. He's all messed up. He said, reject him, turn away from him, uh, refuse him, if you would. You say, why is that? Because of doctrine. Titus 2.1 says this, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. There's a right and there's a wrong doctrine. He says in Titus 2, 7 and 8, he said, in all things sowing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine. Sound speech, he mentions, that cannot be condemned. He says down in verse number 10, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. There's some things that we can't cave on. I'm done. Listen, I'm done. I'm done. How do we live our life once we've been intervened upon? How do I live? I, I'm, number one, I'm going to have to follow the pattern and the example of Jesus. That's what we found on the first half. Uh, on, the, on the top part of the cheeseburger, on the top part of the cheeseburger, I'm going to run with it. On the top part of the cheeseburger, we're going to have to learn to walk like Jesus, to think like Jesus, to respond like Jesus, and to behave like Jesus. On the underside, on the bottom side of that, not only as we deal with ourselves, but as we deal with others, there's some things we're going to have to avoid. There's some things that we're going to have to reject and there's some things that we're going to have to be aware of that we're making sure we're living our life right. Why is that? Why? Because at the end of the day, if I want my life to make a difference, the only thing that I have is my testimony that I can live out. Because if I, my testimony is not right, they're not going to give me the time of day to share the scriptures, to share the word. Hey, let's do this tonight. Would you stand with me? Miss Stephanie, if you'll come and just play a verse or two of invitation tonight. And uh, maybe, maybe this evening you just like to come and say, Lord, would you help me? I just want to be more like Christ. Maybe you just maybe you're good with stopping at the first part of the message and say, I really want to think like Christ. I want to walk like Christ. I want to behave like Christ. I want to respond like Christ. If that's you tonight, why don't you slip out? You know, maybe you came back tonight, or maybe you're here. Uh, you weren't here this morning. You said, Preacher, I don't know that I've ever really had that divine intervention. They, 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 I've ever allowed Christ to take me from the sinner I was before to being born again after Jesus. And, and I really want to know, know more about my salvation. If that's the case tonight, I want you to slip out where you're at. I'd love to take my Bible and show you how you can be saved. Some are praying tonight. Would you just mind the Lord? If you've got a need tonight, you come. Again, some are praying around the altar. Appreciate the fact that God still intervenes. And what a difference He makes once He does. You know, we are, we really are different after He after He moves in, aren't we? Can't help it. Now we still have a flesh. We still have a nature that we're drawn back to if we're not careful, but, but you can't help it. You're different. Think about the illustration maybe of a maybe of a child that's, you know, they they 
They grew up on the streets and they didn't have anything. And there's a family that's wealthy. And maybe that, maybe that wealthy family takes them in. And that family gives them a home. That family gives them clothes. And they give, you know, their, their life, it can't help but change. It can't help be different because they were placed in that family. If the Savior's ever intervened in your life, you can't help but be different. Let's live that in accordance to keep our testimony.